I've been looking forward to this for almost a year now, I guess, we've been uh, planning this. And I think it's so really appropriate that it should be within the tritium, uh, within the three days, the highest holy days of the Christian year, that we come to officially acknowledge what we are about um, and to, to make this church uh, a, a reality. So to be part of that is, is most wonderful. Um, and uh, the truth of it is, when one takes on something, as you have taken it on, when we, we uh, as Christians, we act within context. Um, it, whether you like it or not, uh, religion is a sociological construct. It's a social construct. Uh, not your private faith. Um, your private faith can be independent of the society in which it exists, perhaps, or maybe you can persuade me that it is. But once two of us get together and decide that we share a faith or some variant of a faith, we have made a sociological construct. And the part of the business of religion is to inform the society in which it lives. But it is also informed by the society in which it lives. So that to try to do anything in the name of God with independent of the context uh, in which we are doing it, it's foolish. It's perhaps even irresponsible. So what I'd like to do today is look at the context with you. And the context is, of course, that of... of the great emergence. Now this thing has been called the great convergence, it's been called the fourth turning, it's been called the fifth turning, it's been called a hinge of history, it's been called um, Robert Florida, the economic, uh, economic expert, every once in a while refers to it as the great reset. doesn't matter what you call the thing we're going through. What we're going through now is singular. Uh, and uh, it is only in the context and understanding the context of what we're going through um, that you can effectively serve the kingdom of God um, because as most emergence Christians will tell you now there are we are citizens we have a triple citizenship we are citizens of three things we are citizens of the state uh, we are citizens of the church and we are citizens of the culture and the three cannot be separated of the culture now simply because we are so interconnected uh, by every kind of internet connection and social media, we are so connected now uh, that we can jump the old tribal lines of polity or of geography and arrive at a culture that is indeed globalized, uh, if you want to call it that, which is an unfortunate word. The great emergence, um, and the thing that we are living in now, um, ha is a reflection of the fact that every 500 years, those of us in the world who got our Christianity through the Latin language as opposed to the Syriac or the Greek language, those of us who received our Christianity through uh, the Latin language go through a huge upheaval. Uh, every 500 years. It's a big whoopee. Uh, we in the United States have a, a, a bishop, Mark Dyer, who says when he gets ready to do what I'm about to do today, what you really have to understand to understand where we are is that about every 500 years, the church feels compelled to have a giant rummage sale, and we're having one. Uh, and that's what we're living through. Uh, the giant rummage sale is only part of the great emergence, and we need to be very clear about that. The great emergence is everything in our lives has changed. Uh, for instance, if you were to read the New York Times cover to cover on a Sunday, first of all, you'd be sick and need Jack Daniel. But, but anyway, uh, if you were to read every word in the New York Times, a Sunday edition, you would be exposed to more information than an 18th century gentleman, privileged gentleman, would have been in his whole lifetime. That should stop us dead. It is a fact that every 10 months and 8 days, technical information doubles in our society. That ought to scare you to death. That means there can be no experts singular. There have to be committees of experts. There has to be a coming together every single day of people who are watching and who are willing to share their information. There cannot be a single expert anymore. There, Wikipedia is more accurate than Britannica for a very good reason. Everybody's honing on it all day long, every day, sometimes to my annoyance, but nonetheless, uh, they are doing it. And I think sometimes not to the advancement of human uh, knowledge, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's, it's the great emergence that, whether we like it or not, uh, 110 years ago, the average white male uh, in Latin world lived to be 49 years old. There was no life insurance simply because nobody lived long enough to pay enough to be able to make a premium at the end um, because we died. Everything, 
in, in our country, four million of us were urbanized in 1900. Now, 84% of us live in an urban context, meaning that the, this, the village, with its conservatory effect, with its ability to pass generation to generation, is it, all gone. And so we're making up our lives uh, from new each time. All of those things are great. The Arab Spring is part of the great emergence. Um, in the economic situation in which we are in right now, Fakhrit Zakaria is perhaps the most respected economic analyst in our country. He works for CNN and Time magazine and he refers to what's going on now as mergonomics. Uh, mergonomics is his way of saying that, uh, you know, when, when Greece catches a cold, the world gets pneumonia financially. Uh, and we're all tied together. These are evidences. Everything in our lives has changed economically, politically, sociologically. It's a big whoopee. There is an abyss, if you will, between where we are and where our grandparents were. That always is true to some extent. You, you always have generational shifts. Ours is not a shift. Ours is a huge abyss or crevasse. 500 years ago, when we did it for the last time, it was the Great Reformation. And the Great Reformation of the 16th century uh, was 500 years after uh, the Great Schism, the Great Schism of the 11th century, when East and West split, when Latin Christianity actually then uh, said goodbye to any form of orthodoxy uh, and sent them scuttering off to the East. 500 years before that, we had the Great Decline. Uh, and the great decline happened when Rome fell and Europe entered its dark ages, uh, when indeed patristic uh, Christianity gave way to monastic Christianity. 500 years before that was the great transition or the great transformation as it's usually called, when the era changed, when we went from BC uh, to AD, um, and when, though it sounds supersessionist, the truth of it is, when Christianity came up out of Judaism uh, and everything changed. If we were a mixed group, we would say, that what I'm talking about in these 500 year things is actually a Judeo-Christian phenomenon. That is to say 500 years before the Great Transformation um, we hit the, uh, the Babylonian captivity in which uh, First Temple Judaism was destroyed, Second Temple Judaism was born, uh, and uh, we were off and running in a new form of Judaism. 500 years before the Babylonian captivity, uh, we had the, uh, the fall of the end of the Age of Judges and the rising of the Davidic dynasty out of which Meshua was to come. So that uh, Jews, like Christians, uh, claim the 500-year cycle. Why does it happen? Um, if you know systems theory, there are all kinds of reasons offered by systems theorists for why it is that it happens. I would submit that it really doesn't matter why it happens. It only matters that we realize that it does happen and that we are in one. That's what matters. Bishop Dyer, when he speaks of the rummage sale, though, says that what we need to remember about rummage sales is uh, that, uh, yes, you get rid of a lot of junk. That's why you have them. You, you clean out the place. But every once in a while, when you get rid of the junk, you discover a real treasure. And that's what we need to remember about a rummage sale if we are lucky enough to be living through one. Uh, and he would go on and say, for instance, there's Uncle Huey, whom you could not abide, but he was your great-grandma's favorite, favorite uh, grandson. And so she had Uncle Huey up on the chimney, up on the chimney above the mantelpiece for years and years and years. And don't you know, when she died, the poor old soul willed you Uncle Huey. Uh, and you just couldn't abide him. So you took him upstairs and you put him in the attic face out against the wall and you did nothing with him. And now 20 years later you're having a rummage sale and you go up to the attic and you see that and you think, oh boy. And you take Uncle Huey down to the kitchen and you get a box cutter and you get rid of the old boy like this. Beautiful frame, worth a fortune on eBay. Okay, and that's exactly what we're in the pro trying to find the frames as much as anything. When I speak of 500 year cycles though, it's important that we remember that I said all of those who received our Christianity through the Latin language or were colonialized or colonized by those who had so received. Which is to say that the thing you are about, which is emergence Christianity, the thing you're about 
also exists in real vigorous form in Africa, South Africa, for instance, where it's known as Amahoro. Uh, it exists all over South America where there has been Latinization or transfer of Christian faith through Latin language, where it's known as the Rod del Camino or Generacion Hemahente. It exists in Malaysia. All, we are not working in isolation, and I think it's important we understand, nor did we invent this thing. This thing is, is we are going with it, and we can shape it, and we can form it, and pray Carefully, we will do that and we will serve the kingdom of God but it rests on a clear understanding that we are not alone we work at an international basis because all of us who have so received our tradition are, are functioning out of this now every 500 years is easy to say except that you need to understand that or we need to understand that within the 500 years there are interior cycles that is to say it's easy to stand here and to show that every 500 years this thing happens. What we need to also understand is that every time it happens, every time we go through one of these tsunamis, there is one question that appertains to all, every time, the same question. There are also separate questions that will appertain just to each, uh, each tsunami. But every single time, the first and central question is, where now is the authority? Or how now shall we live? Where now is the authority? Who's making the rules? And after we decide the answer, we take about a hundred years to decide the answer to that question. It'll take us a hundred years to decide where actually the authority is going to be. Then we have a period of about 250 years in which we all agree that that is indeed where the authority is. We may not like it. We may fuss about it. We may want to rebel about it. But we do agree that's where the authority is. And then we have 150 years in which we chip away at the authority and the whole bloody thing starts all over again. The 150 years is called by academics the Perry, as in the Perry emergence or the Perry reformation or the Perry schism. I prefer to call it and refer to it as the tick up because it's less pretentious. Whatever you want to call it, there's 150 years in which you can watch this thing building. Now, most of us are more familiar with the reformation than we are with any other of the previous schisms just because we get it, it affects us more immediately. So look with me briefly. The reformation, we say, was dated dated from October 31st, 1517. Well, bully for us. Of course it wasn't dated from then. It just means that that's the day in which the 95 theses were supposedly tacked on the door of the church of Wittenberg. Actually, they weren't. He did write the 95, but he didn't tack them up, whatever. Anyway, uh, the 95 did happen, and they were promulgated on October 31st, 1517. But they were the, they were the final proof that we were into something. And so academically, it's convenient or economical to say, okay, on that date, we can honestly say we're in the Reformation. But the truth of it is, those of you who will remember history at all, remember that by the Reformation actually is either dated from John Wycliffe in the middle of the 14th century, or by 1390, there's no question, we are deeply into change. When the Great Schism happened in the 11th century, uh, it had to, when got rid of Constantinople and got rid of the East and the influence of Orthodoxy, it had to establish an authority. And the authority it established was the Pope and uh, the Vatican, the Curia, the Magisterium, and that held right up until 1390. But by 1390, you've got three armed popes running all over uh, the south of Europe, raping and bill uh, pillaging and burning, saying, uh, you know, I am chosen by God. Well, unless God's schizophrenic, we can't have three of you. Uh, it, it just won't work. And so, uh, and, and especially if you're being raped, burned, and pillaged, you really don't like it. Uh, and and the, the peasants, even the, the dumbest, most illiterate serf, uh, took it really personally that in the name of God, they were being burned out. Uh, and so we begin to get a serious chipping away at the power of the Pope to speak for God uh, and to tell us what God would have us do in our individual lives. And it goes straight from there. You can watch uh, by the middle of by 1450s, uh, uh, Constantinople is, is falling and you're getting the influx back into continental Europe of all 
all of the Greek and Latin scholars uh, who bring with them the great treasures. The Septuagint had been lost to Christianity. It comes back out of Constantinople in 1453. Uh, they even bring Plato and Aristotle, which is perhaps unfortunate, depending on your <laughs> point of view. Uh, I would think could have lived without Plato a whole lot better as a Christian if he hadn't shown up, but that's okay, uh, or what we did with him. Uh, but they bring him in, and we get something sort of called the Renaissance. It's part of the Peri-Reformation. Then by 15, uh, 1457, you get a fool who takes a perfectly good wine press and puts paper into it instead of grapes. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but no Episcopalian would have ever done that. I don't know about, you know, we would have never wasted that. Uh, how, mu how, much did, how much did the printing press actually cause the Reformation? Well, we probably exaggerate it as a cause. It certainly was an effector after the fact. But there were only about 7,000 manuscripts produced before 1517 uh, on that. And 6,000 of them were theologians talking to theologians, which, as we all know, never goes anywhere anyway uh, and never bothers anybody. Uh, 1,000 of them, though, were the genius of, uh, of, the ref of the great reformers because those thousand were almost all music uh, in which um, it, it was clear to Luther and company that even in an illiterate society, all you had to have was one man who could carry a tune in one, in one community and then you just set the new theology to music uh, and you were off and running. Uh, and of course the same thing has happened this time, has happened this time, has happened this time, has happened this time. One more praise song and I'm going to kill somebody uh, but but it's it, 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 you know it's it's the same sort the music always carries it look at the history of music and you will see uh, brilliantly the parries of all of these uh, because it's the music the history of music in which it's most graphic of all the arts in which it's most graphically seen by 1492 and, and I want to stop I know I'm um, yeah, we will be here at 5 o'clock this afternoon, but that's all right. In 1492, uh, the obvious thing, some fool sailed on a flat earth and didn't fall off. Um, and uh, did anybody in 1492 think that the world was flat? Of course not. No thinking human being. I mean, you can watch a boat. You know. But the church taught that it was flat. The church taught it stacked. Here's hell, here's the earth, and here's heaven. And that was fine to have a church truth and a common sense truth until Columbus proved that the church was just bone out wrong. And he gave us a curved universe. This sounds simplistic. Why does it matter? Well, if you look at the records, why it matters is that if I am living in the UK or what is going to become the UK and I ascend in a round earth, I'm going to go this way and my Lord died and was resurrected and ascended in the Holy Land and he's going to go this way and I will never see my Lord. I ask you to take that leap of, of backward memory with me and understand the tragedy of what, we were, what they were facing. They had built their life on a heaven in which they would be with their Lord and then suddenly they get the kind of universe that does not fit. You have to be very literalistic to, to do this. The point here is that if in what we do, maybe it's the first point of significance, if in what we do, even though we who know that the round, the, it's a round world, if in what we do we forget to move with compassion for those who cannot go with us where we are going, for those who, cannot, who are on the other side of the abyss, if we ever forget the tragedy of having built your life on one conceptualization, and then in midlife or in old age to suddenly have it yanked out from you and to realize you've built the whole thing on an era. That's tragic. So may God grant us, if nothing else, compassion uh, in what we do and in how we do it. Even though we would like to kill all the flat earth people because they're fools and idiots. Um, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and they get in the way. And, and so it goes. Copernicus, by uh, the records show, by 1509, actually some argue by 1507, Copernicus is, is uh, circulating his ideas. He's smart enough to not really um, publish them until after 1517. But thing after thing leads up to, to uh, the whole business of the Reformation so that when it comes, it's had 150 years Years of saying the Pope is wrong, the Magisterium is wrong, the Curia, uh, the Curia is wrong. And so you get to 1517 and there is this resounding silence. And the question arises, so where now is the authority? Who now is making the rules? 
And Martin Luther answers, sola scriptura, scriptura sola. Now, those of you who know Latin know that sola means only, and he had five solas, which means Luther didn't understand Latin too well, or he just got a little carried away. Yes, he did have sola fides, he did have, and he did have the priesthood of all believers, but sola scriptura. Now, in all fairness, I love to tease Luther. Um, I have to sometimes temper it with remembrance that he died a horrible death, uh, a lingering death with colorectal cancer, uh, which probably explains part of what's wrong with Protestantism. No, I didn't say that. Uh, but anyway... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I think that, but I don't usually say that. Uh, you can take it out of the film. But, but sola scriptura, uh, scriptura sola, is not the same as Protestant inerrancy. In all fairness to Luther, he can't be blamed for what we made out of sola scriptura. He intended something a bit different. Uh, but in sola scriptura, inherent in sola scriptura, were all the seeds of what we have come to do. Um, for instance, when there is a priesthood of all believers and you've got a book now running the show, you have to have everybody educated. So Protestants' great gift uh, uh, to Western society was literacy, uh, as it should be. It was necessary. Uh, but its other great gift was divisiveness, because when you give the same section of Scripture to five people who can read, Two of them are going to say it says this. Two of them are going to say it says this. And the fifth one is not going to agree with either uh, any of the other four. And he's going to go looking wildly for the other fifth one of another set to get together. And first thing you know, you've got another denomination. There are in the world now over 39,000 distinctly different, distinguishable from each other Protestant denominations. That's divisiveness gone malignant. And that's one of the problems with Protestantism is that it slices and dices. There's an old joke that the Reformation took, Christian, uh, took uh, Christianity north, not meaning Geneva or Scotland, meaning the head. Uh, and much of the thrust of the, of the reformers was the need to systematize, to take it north, to, to make it, to outline it, to dogmatize it. Uh, and in that push was also the seed of, of their problem. Now, Having said uh, that, let me hasten to say that each time we've gone through one of these tsunamis or whatever, whatever held hegemony of place, whatever form of the faith held hegemony of faith, uh, of place, uh, a pride of place, has not ceased to exist. It simply has to back off and give room, make room for that which is coming. And each time what is coming becomes another one of the tributaries of the river we call Christianity. Protestantism is not going to die. God knows Anglicanism isn't going to die because God's an Anglican, so he couldn't do that. But, <laughs> but none, I mean, I know, I've got years betting on that one. Uh, it's not going to die, uh, but it is going to have to reconfigure, and you're seeing part of that reconfiguration now. If you look at all, you'll see the, the amalgamating or the coming together, the coalescing of various divisions of Christianity into even one corporate structure, some of them. Uh, in Wales, for instance, you see a real coming together uh, of them. So that <clears throat> nothing is gonna go away exactly, but it is gonna have to give, it is gonna have to give room. And so over the, the 250 years of living with Sola Scriptura after it's established forever, uh, we get Protestant inerrancy. And Protestant inerrancy, unfortunately, cannot uh, hold wa water. It, it, will not, it will not work. Uh, and I don't even apologize for saying that. So right on schedule, uh, about 100, uh, 1842 and 43, we get the beginning of the peri-emergence. What you are moving in is a historical movement. It is a movement that has been patterned, and you can, ex you can see the pattern. Don't ever forget that you move within context, not just cultural context, but historical and theological context. And your context, and mine, if I live much longer, begins in 1842-43 with a man named Michael Faraday. Those of you who watched Lost, uh, and I hope some of you did, are aware that Faraday was there, uh, a place of honor by, uh, by the, uh, indicating what Faraday did. Faraday was the man who, uh, who wrote down field theory, who said that electricity and gravity and conductivity can be mathematically described. And the minute he did that, he opened the way for the electric motor and everything in this room and everything in the emergence pivots on Faraday. It is there it begins. Once it starts, everything in this room, including what you just ate and the clothes on your back, have been touched by Faraday. And he's the, he's the linchpin when it happens. Now, you can go from there to obviously 1849, uh, I'm sorry, 59, 
Uh, and a good Christian who almost studied for orders named Charles Darwin. He died an atheist because of the way we treated him. Uh, but Origin of the Species comes out. Uh, and we are then really consciously at a, at a public level off and running uh, because uh, did Darwin say we descended from monkeys? No. Uh, obviously he did not. Doesn't matter what he said, it matters what was heard. And what was heard was that we are descended from monkeys, we are made in the image of God, it therefore follows, if you're deeply logical, that God is a monkey. Uh, and that was intolerable. And we were off and running with the beginning of the pushback in between. You can talk about the 150 years from 1843, or the 160, uh, to 9-11, which is going to be our October 31st, uh, 1517. It's going to be our day for saying this is when, uh, when we now know we are in emergence. You can, you can talk about those 160 years in any number of ways. Because we're pressed for time this morning, I want to show you Protestant inerrancy in a sociological cascade, and then I hope to show it to you in a, looking at it decade by decade. I want to take the first decade of the last century and show you the progress of the peri-emergence because it will explain, I hope, uh, a great deal. I want to take the sociological one and, and hope we get there. Uh, in the years 1855 uh, uh, to 59 or, or 60, um, we in uh, uh, the States were uh, the place where the battle was fought. You certainly were fighting it in the UK as well. We just, it was our blood that was probably shed uh, when the Civil War broke out. We in the South, refer, the South part of the United States, refer to it as the recent great unpleasantness. We don't call it the Civil War. Uh, it's all in the rhetoric, baby. It's always, always been in the, in the rhetoric. But from 55 to 59, you can watch, you can pull the correspondence of churchmen in the United States. I suspect you could do it also in the UK, but in the United States, you can, you can watch northern churchmen breaking away from southern churchmen. Why? Not because they want to argue about slavery. The argument is, can we get rid of it without calling it wrong? By 1856, 57, 58, it was clear that slavery was an economic issue uh, and, and that it made no sense and that to try to keep it was not smart. Even the, uh, even the Southern churchmen understood that. The problem was saying it's wrong. Why? Because the Bible does not say go buy somebody. But the Bible clearly, uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy both, provide for the care of the slave. And even if you want to say that's just yesterday's news and contextual, then you hit Onesimus and Philemon, where there is clear acceptance of slavery in Holy Writ. Even worse, Jesus tells a story or two about a slave and his relationship with the master. It is a fool who argues that slavery does not exist canonically. It just does. So, are you going to say the Bible was wrong? Are you going to say it was temporally uh, or culturally contextualized? Are you going to say, oh my God, you've begun to chip away at, at inerrancy. You have begun to say, and that's what the fight was primarily about when you get right down to it. But then we got over it uh, to some extent. And Mr. Obama is coming to your country. God love him. He's a lucky man. Uh, you know, to, uh, <laughs> he needs a vacation from us. You all be good to him, please. Um, but... <laughs> And so we go on and we get to the end of the First World War, 1917, 1919, it's fought in 1921, and we get to those uppity women. Now, we've had uppity women for a number of years, but by 1919, 1920, 21, they are saying, no, I will absolutely have a bank account without a male cosigner. I will own property without a male signatory. I will have that. Now there is in uh, Greek drama a uh, play by Aristophanes called the Lysistrata, which if you've not gotten anything else out of this, you should go read the Lysistrata. Because the theme of the Lysistrata is that if enough women really want something and they get together and they pledge each other that at all costs they are going to get it, they always will because they can cut off the supply. And it's not supper we're talking about. <laughs> and, 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 and that's exactly what happened. Now, we don't enfranchise them for another little while, but we, you know, at this point, you own a house, by God, you're enfranchised to some extent, you know? And, and so, uh, we go along. The problem is, from a church point of view, that the Bible is very 
It's patriarchal. It's a fool's errand to say that there is equality of the genders in the Bible. It ain't there. It just isn't, you know? Uh, Paul, for heaven's sakes, Paul said things that we're going to have words if when I die we end up in the same place. Uh, you know, <laughs> which is, uh, well, never, never mind. I, 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 I just got, but, but, you know, it's, it's very clear a woman's supposed to shut up. Uh, if a woman has, you know, anything in question in church, let her wait till afterwards and ask her husband at home. I don't think so, but he wishes it had not gone away. Uh, it would have been a much better world if, if it had not gone away. So, so we, we now have got women doing all kinds of weird things. And it's fine until we get to the Second World War. And by the time we get down here to 1942, 43, uh, We've got a problem. We've got a world war going on. And we've got, in the United States especially, we've got nothing to fight it with. We sent all of our munitions and all of our boats and tanks off to Japan, hoping they would get rid of them for us. They did. They just refurbished them and sent them back. We called it Pearl Harbor. Uh, and we were about to, we were about to lose uh, everything. All we had was guys. We called them Johnny. Uh, and Johnny was off to war, but to fight with nothing. Uh, and all Johnny had was his wife. We called her originally Wendy the Welder, and then she became Rosie the Riveter, and she's kind of an icon in the United States. Uh, but she went to work for the first time in Western history. The woman, for the sake of the home, left the home to go do something and get money out of it. Uh, the money was not significant, but she was doing it for Johnny. She was doing, the motivation was clearly for Johnny uh, and for the home. There's no question what it was about. But the interesting thing happened, and the University of Michigan has perhaps the best file of women's studies, uh, and it's fascinating to go in and, and see. But within about six months, Rosie, or whatever you want to call her, is really tired at the end of 10 hours. She's, she's doing a man's work, and she's exhausted legitimately. And in about, within about six months, she realizes she, she has had to take the two and a half children down the sidewalk, down the picket fence, and leave them with Grandma. Grandma hated the war more than Rosie did, but anyway, she got the kids. But, but Rosie realizes, I'm tired. And then she thinks, I can't face those children right now. And then she thinks, stroke of genius, when Johnny was tired, when he was exhausted, he went to the pub and had a couple before he came home, and everything was much better. And within six months, you can see Rosie and company, her confreres, her sisters, going into the pub to have a couple before they go back to pick up the two and a half kids. Does this mean Rosie becomes a drunk? No. Not, I'm sure some, some of them did. Probably they were nipping out of the vanilla long before the war started if they were alcoholically inclined. But it, it's not that... It's that what Ray Olenberg, the scholar Ray Olenberg, calls the discovery of the third good place, which is to say for the first time in Western history, a woman found a place where she could actually socialize in a non-domestic situation. She didn't have to talk about quilting or making clothes or rearing children or a, some kind of wonderful new recipe. She could bitch about the boss, if you want to put it honestly, or what a fool he was, uh, or how much it would be easier to do it a different way or what was wrong. She was talking non-domestic issues and socializing in a space that was not domestic. It's going to be enormously important. Now, the war is over because she does her job well. Um, and Johnny comes marching home again. And when Johnny comes marching home again, we go back to the old system. Uh, and uh, if, only boy, if Johnny and, and Rosie had only had boys, that would have been all right. But Johnny and Rosie had had some girls. They'd had some girls before Johnny went off to war. And those girls remembered they remember that once there was a time when daddy was at war, and this is not a feminist statement. I'm asking you to look at this sociologically. You can't have seven kids by the same man and be a feminist with credibility, I've discovered. So I, I, I'm not a feminist. It takes a lot of imagination, but it doesn't take, you know. Uh, so you're, 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 the, the thing that happened was uh, those girls, we call them Betty for Dan or Gloria Steinem or... They remembered uh, a time when you didn't have to ask daddy if you wanted something. It was sufficient to ask mama. You could go and you could get what you wanted from mama. You didn't have to ask. And there was a time when mama whistled, uh, but now mama can't whistle because it's something about crowing hens and whistling women come to no good end and daddy doesn't like it. Uh, mama can't go to the bar and meet with her girlfriends. Uh, daddy doesn't approve. 
And most important, uh, when daddy was gone, we didn't hear those angry noises at night after lights out when they were fussing. And so they took an oath to themselves, it won't happen on my watch. And we get, and, and we're going to go. We're going to go get a, a college degree, uh, and we're going to be able to support ourselves. And you get the birth of real active feminism. Now, the first generation of them. No, uh, the first generation of them, uh, it's an uneven ceiling, it's an uneven glass ceiling, and they don't succeed. Uh, with the coming of the birth control pill, they're going to learn, women are going to learn to regulate the menses so that it fits the business cycle better, and you're gonna get the evening of the ceiling, and now it's not unusual for a woman to make more money than the husband, or even for the husband to stay home and rear the family. You get that. What happens? What happens is, in terms of the church, that when, by, by 1965, 67, 68, by 1970, as the glass ceiling becomes more and more even, you get both partners going out like this to conquer the world, because they can now. Now, up, traditionally, in the traditional home, Johnny had gone out to conquer the world for the sake of the home. He might have misbehaved out here, but he did go out and it was understood it was for the home. Now they're both going out like this and the home is reconfigured as the place where they come to restore themselves so they can go conquer the world again, right? And what happens then is that the home, Judeo-Christianity has always been transmitted domestically. Up until now, up until we get right here, it is transmitted domestically. It is the woman who, for whatever reason, passes on the faith, passes on the narratives, tells the stories, even as she's doing household uh, chores, but she's there constantly transmitting it. When now you've got her going out and him going out, and they come home half dead at night, and it's really hard to bless takeout from McDonald's or Subway or Sparkle. It just really is. It takes a lot of Christian belief to bless that mess. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and so we get less of it. Family prayers don't entirely go, but now it's one parent while the other one has to do the laundry, for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, because, and so family What happens is we get in Europe the first, and in, in our country both, you get the first generation of the biblically illiterate. They are those who have not had that maternal transfer day in, day out, unselfconscious oozing in of the story into the children. And so unless Fisher Price made a toy out of it, they are clueless. Thus they know Noah and the ark, you know, and they know Daniel and the lion's den, the rest, and they don't know which came first. So that what we, the missional field in which you and I are working is the biblically illiterate. And anybody will tell you that's not a tragedy. That's almost an advantage because what you've got is tabula rasa. Uh, as long as you tell the story and not the propositions, we're ready to go. We're good to go. Now, in between here, what I want to go back here and do also is that um, uh, when the war is over, when the Second World War is over, uh, we, um, we didn't have the word uh, post-traumatic syndrome. We had shell-shocked, uh, left over from the First War. And what it, by any name, what it refers to is the fact that the men who came home from the Second World War, which was the world's worst war, most horrific, uh, many of them were damaged uh, psychologically, psychiatrically, beyond any hope. They weren't going to fix. Uh, and when they came home, they came home dangerous to their families, uh, dangerous to their children, uh, dangerous to themselves. Uh, uh, as I was growing up, um, there was in, in our congregation a beautiful young woman who had two little girls born before their dad went to war. He was a great guy. He was a wonderful guy when he went off. When he came back, he was the meanest, you know what, uh, you've ever seen. And the Bible is very clear. You shall not divorce. Our Lord does not speak a great deal about gender issues. He does not speak about sexual issues, but he sure speaks about divorce. And because she was a deep Christian, she refused to divorce him until the day he took the four-year-old and whipped her like this and threw her in the wall and broke the arm, uh, at which case, in which time she divorced, uh, simply because she had to, to protect the children. And everything was fine until the first Sunday, first Sabbath day, after the divorce was granted when she was met on the street by two of our elders and taken up to the upper gallery, lest her presence as an adulteress contaminate the holiness of those of us who were in the nave or the sanctuary. When we had the Lord's Supper for the first time, before the plates were uncovered, 
These same two elders went up and got her and those two little girls and took them out and put them on the street because the plate could not be uncovered or the chalice passed until such time as the adulteress had been removed. That's horrifying to us. It is the beginning of, of the emergence position of the theology of Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to love mercy, do justice, and, and walk humbly with your God. But the minute you apply Micah 6, 8, you have undone what our Lord clearly says. Thou shalt not do this. But we said, you know, there's a reason for this. There's a reason. And so we changed scripture. And again, and, and so things go. And indeed, then, you know, some fool woman wants to be ordained. What a concept. Uh, Paul really rolled over in his grave on that one. Uh, and then in our country, we even made one the presiding bishop. Uh, how awful is that? And she was here not long ago uh, giving a really good sermon, I thought. I hope you all got to hear it when she was speaking in the, in the cathedral uh, for, for Dean Dunn. Um, but uh, anyway, so all of that uh, keeps on going and we push it and we push it until in the sociological cascade we get to 1969 and a thing called Stonewall it's the last puck and what I hope you've got out of it in a sociological cascade what I'm trying to show you is how Protestant inerrancy got eroded in sociological structures the gay issue matters now only because it's the last sociological piece in a deadly game about the nature of scripture. When sola scriptura dies, then we're left with a resounding question, where now is our authority? And that's the question your generation, and most of you anyway, are gonna have to answer. That's the one that's on your plate. The gay issue matters almost not at all. 10% of Western society is born gay, Lesbian, bi, trans, or with uh, Turner's, uh, Klangfellers, some other DNA. Clearly the Bible speaks. It is, it is against homosexuality. There's no question. It's a fool's errand to argue that it's not. But it's equally a fool's errand to ignore Micah 6, 8. It is equally a fool's errand to not also understand what the consequences are of that decision because there's nothing to play the game with. Now I want to look real quickly, how am I doing on time? I want to look real quickly at, what? You're lying, 15 minutes ain't gonna get it. Okay, all right, let me write quickly. It, it, it's imperative we understand what happened. What you do with it comes this afternoon, I guess, or somebody more enlightened than, but it's imperative we understand what, what, why inerrancy went and why ultimately when we get ready to decide the authority question, it's going to have to incorporate some notion of what scripture is. What is the place of scripture? What is it in this new thing we are building? How does it function? Let's look, if we may, right quickly at the first decade of the last century. Uh, let's look at 1900 to 1910 or at much of it as I can. 1900 is the year in which Albert Schweitzer uh, one of the first real big stars because by now we've got cheap newspapers, cheap magazines, and we've got the Telegraph, uh, and we can make a star, and he's a star as an organist. Sitting in Alsace-Lorraine on his porch, one summer afternoon suddenly says to himself, Dear God, what if Jesus of Nazareth and the Christ I follow aren't the same? And answered himself by saying, Of course they're not. We've got 2,000 years of interpreting and reinterpreting and structuring and handling him. They cannot be the same. Leading him then to say, and I can never know my Lord. Leading him then to say, and therefore the only thing I can do is to try to live as I think my Lord would live in the context that I am presently in. And so he goes to Africa. In the course of it, though, he writes a book called The Quest of the Historical Jesus. And the quest of the historical Jesus is going to be the first time in a popular conversation. The question had been raised in seminaries a couple of hundred years earlier. But it's the first time in a popular conversation, because he is a rock star, or the equivalent in 1900 of a rock star, that the question had been raised of who was Jesus. And what we get is the quest of the historical Jesus. And it's going to go straight to 1945 and Nag Hammadi, and to 1947 and Qumran, to the 1980s and the Jesus Seminar, and the work of men like uh, N.T. Wright and Spong and Borg, Marcus Borg, all of them saying, who was he? And all of them saying, 
which part of the canon really is right. And you need to understand what happens in this particular. For the first time, we're discovering scripts and manuscripts that weren't even available when the canon was set. We're also becoming more sophisticated in, in, in deconstruction of scripts to understand that part of what we have attributed to the red letters may have been a later edition, and you can tell that in a scholarly way. And if you lay enough manuscripts up chronologically, you can see how the additions were made or how even some changes were made. All of a sudden, Scripture is not nearly as clear as it was. Every time we've gone through one of these 500-year things, one of the characteristics has been that the canon has been up for grabs. Ladies and gentlemen, the canon is up for grabs right now. And it begins right here. And if you think it isn't, you need to educate yourself. The nature of Scripture, the basis of Scripture is authority. It's fine. I had a bishop say to me the other day, there's absolutely nothing wrong with sola scriptura except the sola part and the scriptura part. The rest is fine. Uh, and and, and he's, he's absolutely right. We've got to understand that the rock has shifted and we need to know what the rock is. Uh, by uh, I'm going to skip. I'm going to go to 1905 when some smart-ass young Jew named Albert Einstein wrote four papers. Uh, and in the same way that Reformation is characterized by Newtonian physics and macrophysics, if you want to call it that, so emergence is characterized by microphysics or by Einsteinian physics. Uh, always there has been a huge scientific lurch forward in one of these things. And Einstein was our boy. Um, and not to belabor it, the first one was when he actually looked at light and said it moves both in it can move in a wave or it can move in a, in a bundle or particle. Uh, and I'm going to call those bundles uh, quanta. A quantas, uh, and each one of them is a quantum. Welcome to quantum physics. Welcome to our understanding of, of, mac of, of microphysics. The second one was Brownian motion, and as a child in the country 70 odd years ago, I used to play with it all the time, not knowing what I was playing with, but it goes like this. If you take a perfectly flat and firm uh, surface, and you put a bucket of water on it, and you let the water settle down for a minute so that it's not moving, and you take something. I used to take pollen, because it was fun. Pollen and put it right in the middle of the bucket and it doesn't do anything for a minute and then it goes and you begin to see it move and it'll eventually move like this um, and nobody could understand it's called Brownian motion nobody could understand the mystery of why dead material would move on a flat surface that was not being uh, disturbed in any way and Einstein just simply said it's because you're making a false assumption you're assuming that the pollen is dead and let me tell you there is nothing dead there is no such thing as dead everything is composed of even Matt is composed of atoms atoms are composed of nuclei and protons and electrons and they too have quarks in them, yada de yada de yada de. Welcome to Hiroshima. Welcome to the first time in, in history that we have known we can destroy Mother Earth completely and we can destroy each other. Welcome to the age of anxiety and you can watch it go right across and it still informs every part of us. The third paper was special relativity. He, this is the one that broke Einstein's heart. Uh, and to the day he died, he regretted this one. In 1915, he's going to try to write general relativity to get to unsay part of it or to at least expand it, uh, in which he essentially said, it appears in physics that there's no such thing as an absolute truth. And he went to his grave saying, there is an absolute truth. I just can't find it. What, what special relativity proved was that I cannot both tell you where you are and how fast you're moving at the same time. I can tell you how fast you're moving or I can tell you where you are. I can't tell you both at the same time because it's relative to my position and your position. Out of special relativity, we're gonna get in science all kinds of things. The notion that time can be slowed, for instance. The ability to visit the moon uh, and one of the funniest stories about that first visit on the moon 41 years ago, 42 years ago now, um, was that we didn't find uh, God's, God's feet on the moon. And about half of the people in my country still deny we've ever been to the moon. The argument being that we would have seen God's footprints on the moon if we'd really been there, that it was all, you know, go figure, uh, whatever. Uh, but because, because uh, Isaiah, actually, actually Isaiah says that the earth is God's footstool, but it doesn't look like a good time to do exegesis. So if they want it on the moon, it doesn't matter. But, uh, but denying that. So 
Also, welcome to the bending of time, the slowing of time, and now perhaps there is good physics. And again, I don't think you can function even in, in Holy Trinity without some awareness of basic physics, at least in, in terms of popular review of it. The, the ability now to perhaps change time uh, or to change the past, which is a little scary theologically, uh, but has good science behind it now. Uh, but also, um, uh, in, in addition uh, to all of that, <coughs> once, we, once we have introduced these ideas, we have introduced relativity, and so welcome to all of tw almost all of 20th century philosophy. Welcome to Foucault. Welcome to Dorada. Welcome to existentialism. Uh, all of them are coming up out of this new discovery of the nature of who we are. And one of the things about us is we don't know who we are. And it, it rests here. And then um, the fourth one was energy uh, equals mass times the speed of light uh, amount, uh, squared. Uh, the most famous formula, of course, of all uh, in physics. The interesting thing about it being that there is now a thing called information theory. Not all physicists agree, uh, but increasingly there is consensus uh, that uh, there may not be mass that maybe the only thing that is is information and energy, um, which is, of course, entirely consonant with Christian scripture. In the beginning was the word, and God is love, uh, which it makes it look as if even mass itself. We may be fig newtons of our own imagination uh, as we move around in body. So that then, 1906, 1906 that matters. I don't care if the hour's up. <laughs> 1906. <laughs> 1906 because we can't avoid it. 1906 is the year, and uh, when Martin Marty, that great scholar of religion, does what I'm doing, uh, he tries to get all of this down to three or four points. And the one everybody agrees on is you can't avoid 1906. 1906 is the year in which a young African-American uh, named William Seymour, his mama was named Phyllis, and I'm partial to him as a result. Uh, William Seymour, who had been converted to Christianity, he, he was born free. She was born uh, a slave, but he was born free in Mississippi, the southern part of the United States. Um, converted about age 18, uh, persuaded of the Christian story, uh, but persuaded also that something was wrong, that something had happened at Pentecost that hadn't happened since and that we needed to worry about that. And full of restiveness and full of urgent prayer, he began to work his way across the lower part of the United States. He stopped briefly in Kansas uh, with the Fillmores, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. If you look at 19th century history, uh, religious history, you are aware that it is a century in which faith after faith and religion after religion is born. Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventist, unity, which is what the Fillmores were, uh, Christian science, theosophy. As we struggle, it's as if without saying to ourselves we realize we're in trouble and so we invent all these religions to try to compensate to try to figure out what's wrong and so he stops with the Fillmore's but it doesn't work and he finally ends up at a cousin's house on Bonnie Bray Street in LA and he preaches there every night praying for the spirit to come until so many people come that the porch falls off the cousin's house and the cousin evicts him. We call that locking the barn door after the horse is stolen in the south. I don't know what you call it. And he goes down to an old stable. And I love the romanticist in me loves the fact it's a stable. He goes down to an old stable that had been a Methodist church and then he reconsecrates it. Uh, and then it made a stable again. Then he reconsecrates it and he begins to preach there. The second week uh, of Seymour's preaching, the the Spirit comes. The Spirit comes on two men who are listening to him. And when I say that, I mean the tongues of fire descend and there is glossolalia and xenolalia, the charisms of Pentecost itself. The next night it falls on everybody who's gathered there, including Seymour. Pentecostalism is born. They will stay in that stable for our converted stable for two and a half years before they begin to spread out across the world. Now, this is, is difficult, so please hear what I really say. I don't mind being judged for what I say. I hate it when it's not what I said. Um, the, the truth of it is, whether we like it or not, the Holy Spirit had not been corporately, visibly, and consistently active since Pentecost until you get to Azusa Street. Had the Holy Spirit been present in individual lives? Yes. Had the Holy Spirit been present sometimes in the lives of mystics, four or five of them gathered together? Yes. But with the charisms, 
with the, and those charisms were very real. You can read the LA Times and read what hardcore reporters saw and heard. You can park psychosomatic illness wherever you want to park it. Uh, yes, psychosomatic illness. I've been cured 2,000 times of psychosomatic uh, illnesses. I, you know, I will present the symptoms and he'll say it's not in the book, so suck it up and I'm cured. I mean, you know, what, what do you want? Uh, <laughs> but but this, this, this is broken bones that leave no scar. This is, this is genuine charism. And this is the birth of Pentecostalism. And whatever else you do, and in, in with Holy Trinity or anywhere else you are working with in emergence Christianity, remember this one thing. The Holy Spirit comes and is active in a whole different way. Now, Martin Marty, but let me particularly quote Harvey Cox, and then I'm really going to shut up. Harvey Cox, who's perhaps the most revered religionist, uh, uh, certainly working in English, but probably in the European uh, or, or the uh, first world context, March of last year, published a book called The Future of Faith, in which he argues, and he's the most prominent and the best credential to so argue, but his voice is not the only one, in which he argues, as did the medieval mystics, that there would be 7,000 years to human dispensation. There would be 2,000 years from uh, the Garden of Eden uh, to the cross. And they would be the 2,000 years of God the Father in which we would struggle to understand and engage God the Father. And then even the medieval mystics, Joachim of Fiorne being the most articulate, sitting in the late, 12th, uh, late 11th century said, and there will be 2,000 years from the cross to 2,000 Anno Domini. They nailed it. They were off by two years, but you know, poor babies. Uh, but, but, but they nailed it dead on. Those will be the, year, the, two, the millennia, the 2,000 years of God the Son. Uh, in which we will struggle to understand the Son uh, and to serve the Son. And then they said, and Cox uh, says, watch out. There will be the next 2,000 years from 2,000 Anno Domini to 4,000, and they will be the years of God the Holy Spirit. Wherever you want to, when a man like Cox argues that case, when he goes back and looks at what the mystics, Christian prophets is what mystics are, have consistently said about... We have not, and Cox goes on to say, he doesn't say you can forget the 500 year thing. Uh, he doesn't say it that way. But what he, can say, what he says is, you don't need to worry about the 500 year things and you are so in it, you don't need to worry. Those were as nothing compared to what we are in. And Cox says, what we are in right now, this shift, this great emergence, the emergence of Christianity coming out of it, whatever you want to call it, is analogous to what happened 2,000 years ago and the change of the era that this is the biggie and that we have shifted and anybody who works with an emergence Christianity without understanding the intimacy, respecting the intimacy of engagement of the Holy Spirit, the necessity for discernment, the approach to the scripture through communal discernment instead of individual discernment, anybody who goes into those waters without understanding we go into a new era in Christian history and you're gonna be the ones who form it and it's going to have to depend on the ability to engage the Holy Spirit in the way that began at Azusa Street. These are significant times. I won't live to see them, but may God bless those of you who are not as white-haired as I. And I'm coming back in 75 years to see how you guys did.